What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Action Network podcast series. This is the Experts Guide to Betting. I'm your host, Dane Martinez, the spitting statistician, and we get started today with the NHL. You know what I always like to say. We don't just give you a fish. We like to teach you how to fish, and that's what we are going to aim to do here with our Expert Guides to Betting. And when we go to the NHL, there is no guy better than our Action Network hockey analyst, Michael Leboff. So, Mike, Mike, you're going to help us all become better fishermen today. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing well. I'm very excited to talk about uh, betting on the NHL, one of my three passions in life. Okay, I'll, we'll ask you about the other two at another time. But let's start off, like, to be quite honest, I hate to say it this way, but what qualifies you as an expert? Like, how long have you been betting? How often are you betting? Like, how long have you been doing this, Mike? Man, uh, it's probably been over a decade at this point for me betting on the NHL basically every day of every season. Um, and part of part of what makes me an expert is, is that I've, I've paid my dues. I've, I've kind of paid my tuition of, of making the, the dumb mistakes that every novice NHL better or novice sports better in general will make and um, and learning from them uh, and talking to people who, who have gone through the same process as I have and learning from them and, and basically taking parts of, of what made them successful at whether it's betting on the NHL or tennis or whatever, and, and learning from that and incorporating it into how I go about uh, handicapping a sport that is uh, just absurd. Yeah. Okay. So you've gone to the school of hard knocks or let's call it the school of emotion or undiscipline or believing the lower body injury. But I guess if people are new, to betting the NHL, right? It can be intimidating, you know? We see puck lines, we see shots on goal props. You know, is it possible? Is it possible to become a sharper hockey better over time and actually be profitable and successful? Yes, definitely. Uh, It's hard, just like any other sport, and and your expectations need to kind of be adjusted to that. Like, you're not going to, if you're just starting out betting on the NHL, maybe you you think you've got to figure it out uh, and you have like a hot start to a season, uh, you're going to get put on, on your, on your behind uh, at some point, And you just need to know that. Um, so it, managing your expectations to begin with is, is very important. Um, but from there, yeah, there is like the NHL is uh, compared to other markets like the NFL or college football, the NBA at this point, like it's a softer market because less, there's less money in it. Right. So the, the lines are a little softer compared to, you know, Jets Titans on a Thursday night football, which is going to do a bigger handle than basically the entire NHL season. So your chance of success while still small is a little bit greater than if you were trying to take on, you know, the big beast that is the NFL. Uh, So if, as long as you're able to kind of go into the NHL season, willing to learn and, and learn from your mistakes and, and knowing that I'm going to fail at some point and then be able to pick yourself up, you should give yourself a chance uh, to succeed and become better. Yeah, I guess that's an important part, right, Mike? You know, you're going to fail uh, 40% of the time, right? At least. And if you fail 40% of the time, you're actually an amazing sports investor in the NHL. So let's get it started, Mike. I mean, to get to yourself to bet regularly on the NHL, what would you consider one of the most like foundational, big rock cornerstone elements of betting the NHL. If you were talking to somebody new, what are some of the first things they really need to understand? Yeah, well, I mean, the first thing you want to you just be aware of is that it's a money line sport, right? You're not dealing with spreads. So the, the market isn't leveling the playing field for you. You need to become familiar with probabilities and what implied probability means in terms of a money line. So, you know, minus 110, minus 110, that's a pick them. That means basically 50% on each side. And as it adjusts one way or the other, those uh, probabilities increase or decrease. So you're not picking, let's say, you know, that the the senators are plus 130 and they're taking on a team that's minus 150. You're not thinking, oh, do I think the senators are going to win? It's, do I think the senators are going to win more than, you know, blank percent of the time, whatever it's correlated to in that, uh, in that, in that case, right? So that's step one is, is becoming familiar with what you are trying to, to accomplish. You're trying to beat the, or provide yourself with expected value against the, the money line if you're betting the money line, right? Okay, so once you get that very foundational aspect of knowing what like improb- implied probabilities and what you're actually betting into, then you need to start becoming com- comfortable with the beast of the NHL, which is 
you're going to have to bet on bad teams, right? Like this is a money line sport. We know from betting that typically favorites are going to be inflated in value. So you need to just realize, look, they're going to, you're like riding the sabers on a daily basis. Oh, man. Yeah. That, that brings back some, some, some haunting <laughs> stuff, but yeah, yeah. It, you're going to need to realize like the sabers and the coyotes from this, this past 2021, 20, 2022 20, season, they, they were terrible, but just because they're terrible doesn't mean that you just need to cross them off your list and, and ignore them and, and just bet against them every night. You're, you're going, if for that to happen, you're going to need to beat the market at a very, very high clip, which you're just not going to be able to do. So getting comfortable betting these bad, you know, terrible teams is, is, is a really important aspect to betting on the NHL. There's 32 teams in the NHL. 12 are going to be terrible every season. And those 12 are probably going to be the ones that you end up showing the most value on, uh, by the time a season comes to an end. So, you know, Mike, you mentioned that maybe of the four main sports, right? The NHL has the lowest handle. And so you can actually find some soft lines. So that may be something, you know, kind of on the good side for the betters. But, you know, there are some things that are uniquely challenging about the NHL as well. Like, for example, I joked before about the lower body injury. It seems to me that the NHL, more than any other league, is more kind of close to the vest when it comes to injury news, which I know is an important piece of data. It is that kind of the biggest challenge? What other things are really hard about betting the NHL? Yeah, that's definitely one of them, right? Like in the NBA, you have a ton of media coverage and there's, there's not all that many players per team, right? Like the NHL, you're looking at 20 players every night that address 18 skaters, two goalies. Each one of those skaters is important to like the equation, especially the goaltenders, like who, who is playing tonight, who's hurt, who's, who's hundred percent healthy. Maybe someone is, you know, got a personal issue away from the team and NHL coaches are notorious for, for being guarded. And part of that is because there's not as much media pressure for them to, to come out and say, uh, you know, to give away that information because the NHL media machine compared to the NBA or the NFL, it's just, it's, it's like a speck of dust, right? So you're not, that information is going to be really hard to come by and you need to just kind of get with the, with the rhythm of, of, of when it comes out, which is, you know, every morning, most, most mornings, I should say, on a game day for a team, uh, teams will hold morning skates. Then the, the coach will do uh, a media availability. That's usually like 11, and 8, 11 a.m. Eastern time for a 7 p.m. Eastern time game. So you can adjust that per, per your time zone or, or what time zone the game's in. And at that point, you're going to hopefully, and I say, and I really do stress hopefully, learn that who's, who the starting goalie is, what players are hurt, who's, who's coming in and out of the lineup. Maybe there was a call up. And the the problem is that coaches just basically on a whim or how they feel that day will or will not divulge that information. So let me ask you this though. You're, you're talking about kind of on a day-to-day basis, right? Let's zoom out just a little bit in the kind of grand cycle of it all. You know, once Lord Stanley's cup gets hoisted and dented most likely, and people are drinking all sorts of stuff out of it, we're in the off season. As you start to look towards the next season what are some of the things you do to kind of identify what teams are have the arrows pointing up what teams have the arrows pointing down player movement coach movement style what do you kind of do from season to season to kind of index your teams moving forward for the next year yeah one of the the great things about being an nhl fan and and an nhl better is that change is very gradual on a team by team basis. Sure. There, there will be outliers to every rule, maybe team nature coaching change or acquires, you know, a, a great player in the off season in a trade or something. Um, but for the most part, if you're looking at a team of a league of 32 teams, like three fourths of them, 75% of them, they're just following a trajectory, a step-by-step plan towards contention or step-by-step plan towards tanking and then getting back up towards, uh, you know, the top of the mountain. Whereas in the NFL, the player movement is insane. Um, the NBA as well, like teams are just will look completely different from season to season. That's just not the case of the NHL. So wh- while you're not going to know exactly what a team looks is going to look like for you know opening night, just because they of, of how they finished uh, the previous season, you have a general idea of, of what direction they're going, what kind of style of hockey they're playing, how, where their talent level is and how they played last year. So if you take a kind of a look back as you're getting towards training camp for the upcoming season, you take a look back at the 32 teams and you, and you, you become familiar with, you know, their, their underlying metrics, their actual stats, where they finish in a season, you, you should have a pretty good idea of where at least their, their arrows pointing. So for the first 15 or so games of the upcoming season, you're now relying on that information. And, and even though it's, you know, four months old and, and 
there's going to be some wonkiness because of the off season thrown in between it. Like you have a pretty decent idea of what team, what kind of team you're dealing with um, going into said new season. And then as, as that season starts to roll along, you know, 15, 20 games is usually the benchmark that NHL betters like to say, okay, now I'll flip the page and start to really weigh uh, the new season's data. Um, and, and most of the time you'll find out that that new season's data kind of lines up with that arrow pointing from the previous season. Okay. Now, now Mike, you know, you talk about overlaying data right onto your original perceptions and kind of how that adjusts. So take me back day by day, day by day. Once you are in season, you mentioned the morning skate, you mentioned things like an injury report. You mentioned things like when the coach is in front of a microphone, you know, telling you maybe what they are thinking. These are all sources of data. Right. So what are the sources of data that you like to look at on a day by day basis in the season? What are the factors that you actually put more weight into? What are some of the places you go to to find this data on a day by day basis, like on a random Wednesday in February? Yeah, I mean, uh, for for the most part, we all know as betters that the, the box score tends to be a little dishonest and. So for, for the NHL, when you're looking at a, a final score or you're looking at a team's record, it, you have to go below the surface and you have to see what this team's five on five statistical profile looks like. And for that, I'm talking about scoring chance generation, the preventing of scoring chances. And then you can also work in uh, some goaltending stuff. Uh, for me, like expected goals is, is kind of the catch all stat that everybody is wor- uses in the NHL betting community that kind of tells you, okay, like if a team puts up two goals in a game, but their expected goals was 4.8. It tells you that, Hey, this team ran into a hot goaltender, or maybe they're just a little unlucky finishing, uh, take it for, for what you may based on, on, you know, on the game. And uh, if you flip that over defensively and say, okay, this team allowed 4.8 expected goals, that's a lot. Right. Uh, But they only on the scoreboard, it only said one, you know, they were bailed out by their goalie or the other team just couldn't finish. Um, So over the course of a season that those stats will kind of tell you, the true talent level, the true like actual level of a team comp- more than their actual goals and goals against. So relying on that stuff from, you know, moneypuck.com, naturalstattrick.com. Those are the two public models that, that I use the most. Of course, you know, no public model is, is going to be as good as what teams and, and leagues have, like there's going to be flaws to them, but over the course of a long term, like they, these models will give you an idea of just, you know, is this team actually good or are they just getting lucky? So every day you should make a habit to go into places like the action network.com or moneypuck.com or naturalstattrick.com and get used to, you know, what their numbers are telling you, what they mean. And um, just become familiar with like, Hey, expected goals, high danger scoring chances and, and five on five, just generally five on five statistical trends, because Sure. Like there's going to be outliers to every season that have power plays that bail them out or, you know, the special teams are are really good, but 80% of the season is played at five on five. So a team's five on five stats and metrics, they'll give you the better idea of, of, of a team's true level than, you know, their overall play incorporating those, those special teams numbers. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, remember, download the Action Network app because then you get all the data, all the systems, all the tools to be a better, better, like my guy, Michael Leapoff here. We remember we are on the Experts Guide to Betting, the NHL edition here on the Action Network podcast. I'm Dane Martinez, the spitting statistician with Michael Leapoff. Now, now tell me this, you know, I like to say we're not just giving you a fish, we're teaching you how to fish. So kind of define for me here, Mike, what would be an ideal betting opportunity in the NHL? You don't have to tell me like, oh yeah, I like the Oilers and the over tonight, but like, what are the things you're looking for? What is a kind of tried and true blueprint opportunity that you're hunting on a daily basis? Yeah. So over the course of the season, you're going to, if you are betting every day and and I'm not encouraging anyone to just, you know, pick up NHL and bet it every day, but if you are committed to it, like you're going to have to at least follow the season and follow like the low ebbs limits, and flows. Mike. Low <laughs> limits, it's okay. Low limits, right? Every yeah, just, day, low limits. You know, be responsible, all that good stuff. Right. And and you're going to pick up like the ebbs and flows of a season and and of the market because you should pay attention to where the market is closing on a particular team basically every night. So like if you think, oh man, the Minnesota Wild for some reason, I keep thinking that they're going to close as you know minus one thirty in this spot, but they close twenty cents longer, like your number is probably wrong a little bit, or 
you know, maybe you're onto something. So you want to pay attention to that, that kind of stuff. So a, a perfect example would be if you're, if you're paying attention to a team and you're saying, wow, like this team is consistently overperforming against their expected goals. Maybe their goaltender's hot. Um, maybe their power plays hot, whatever. They're on a little bit of, of a hot streak and they're running into a team that maybe the opposite is happening. They're playing well five on five. They're getting opportunities. They're getting more scoring chances than their opposition, but they're just not converting them and they're losing, and those teams meet, you know that Team A, the team that is overperforming, is going to be um, overpriced compared to Team B, and that's a great buy-low opportunity, you know, buy-low, sell-high opportunity, which in, in across any market uh, is, is, is a best practice, right? So you're going to, because you've been paying attention to where these teams have closed and what their, you know, their underlying metrics have been on a game-to-game -game basis, you're going to be able to identify those opportunities, hopefully before the market Will they all win? Absolutely not. But you're probably going to beat the market in those situations. You know, I'm like, one thing they also say is that like the goaltender is probably the most important position in all of sports. How do you hang your hat on goaltending? Yeah, not only is it the most important position in basically any sport, it's also the hardest to project on a game by game basis. It's, it's such an unnatural athletic skill. And generally speaking, it's not all that uncommon for goalies uh, to to kind of like fall off a cliff or to come out of nowhere and put right. together these these crazy seasons. Right. So trying John to Sebastian Jaguar comes. That's to right. Me. He's a <laughs> guy we love. We love Jay. We love Jiggy. Right. Uh, but these he's a perfect example. Uh, Michael Layton is another good one. Like the, there will we will see goalies come out of nowhere and put together you know these spectacular runs or go the other way. Like we saw Sergei Bobrovsky, who was thought to be the best goalie in the NHL for a while. To completely tank a couple seasons ago. So what I'm basically trying to say is that you you need to account for goaltending. You, you'll have a general idea of, of where the level of a certain goalie is, but you can't you can't you know, spend all day thinking like, oh, is Andre Vasilevsky going to have an off night? You're just not going to know that information. So it, while I'm not saying just to like draw a line through the goalie, you just can't try to predict specifically project a goaltender from game to game rather than just use the long-term trend of where is this goalie's level this season and try to keep it at that baseline. Is, is he trending up? Is he trending down rather than being like, Oh, I think he's going to have an off night or I think he's going to steal this one. It, that's just, it's, a, it's, it's just not going to work out for you. And it's just going to drive you insane. It is a fool's errand. I do got to ask you one more thing though, Mike, I've always wanted to ask a, a hockey expert this. And now that we're talking about goaltending, it's perfect. Could theoretically, a team sign like a heavyweight sumo wrestler and just tell them to plug up the goal, like literally cover the entire surface area of the goal, have them just sit there and just pitch shutouts every night. Yeah, you're not going to believe this, uh, but my my beloved New York Islanders and their their late owner, uh, Charles Wong, yes. had that same idea and, and presented it to his front office once. And? Uh, it didn't go very far, which is, you know, it's at some point you're like, hey, it could have, I, I get what he's trying to do. Um, but it, it was, uh, I, I don't want to say it was laughed out of the room because I think people understood the logic, but it was certain, it's certainly still snickered at uh, among the hockey community. Hey, Mike, let me ask you, you know, about two kind of ways that I know people are really excited to bet, not only the NHL, but in general these days. Wanted to get your thoughts on how it applies to the NHL and hockey. And the first is props, okay? Everybody loves betting props. And in other sports, they may be a little bit more straightforward, right? But there's props in the NHL from everything from points to assists to shots on goal to saves. So is there any kind of tried and true strategy in the prop market? So for example, Right, like I'm looking at guys in the shots on goal market that are also on the main power play line, right? Because they are getting those shots. But to be honest, I'm not looking at the big boys. I'm looking at like the second and third guys on those lines. So for example, I'm not taking Nate McKinnon, but I am taking Rantanen and Landeskog on shots on goal props, right? I'm not taking Dreisaitl or McDavid, but I am taking Kane. I'm taking Palat over Kucherov, you know, when it comes to that, because I think they will have those opportunities, but some of those props aren't as inflated. That's just me. How crazy am I, Mike? No, I think your, your uh, logic is sound, right? And you, it's these props all come down to opportunity. And, and because of what we talked about earlier with the, the market generally just isn't paying attention as much to the NHL as they do to other sports, you will have chances, especially the deeper you go in the market, right? Plot props and, and, and those kind of exotic bets to win. So if you, if you have 
if you think you have a pretty good beat on, you know, player props for a certain player, you're like, that's likely to get, you know, continue throughout, you know, at least a stretch of the season until the market truly does catch up. Like right. this, the 2021, uh, 2022 postseason, Nathan McKinnon's overs shots on goal became a, a, a like a mini, I mean, you can't really be a viral sensation in NHL betting because nobody does it. The 18 people that actually do, it became a thing, right? Because it, it kept cashing over. Um, and the books just, you, there's, there comes a point where you just can't go any further up for the books because right. then they'll come back down. Right. So uh, if, if you do think you have a beat because you, you, you notice this player is getting more opportunity on a power play, maybe he's, you know, a young player who, who stepped up in a, in a lineup because somebody else, uh, you know, left free agency or is in trade. And now right. this uh, person's stepping up. If you can beat the market to realizing that, that, that opportunity is coming for this player, you'll have a chance. Okay. And then, you know, you talk about beating the market and, and one time and one way, Mike, that I see that the market almost paints itself into a corner in the NHL is in live betting. And I'd love to get some of your thoughts on live betting. Like, for example, one of the things I've been following to great effect is when there is a tie game in the third period, it seems to me like the book is almost undervaluing the idea of the empty net goal. If it's 2-2 two, two with nine minutes left, they're hanging five and a half. And they can't go to four and a half because you know there's going to be an extra goal. But it seems like they undervalue the fact that if a team scores with two and a half minutes left to go, other teams going to pull that goalie. They're going to have a great opportunity to get another one pushing that live total over. That's something I've seen, especially with teams kind of more and more pulling their goalie even earlier in the game when down by one hell even when down by two that's something i've seen in live betting do you agree what do you see in live betting the nhl yeah that's definitely one the the the, the empty net just looms large in the yeah. nhl to begin with and like you said there is now a general tr trend of, of coaches they could be down three nothing in a game and with nine minutes left they're pulling the goalie yeah. um so if you, you can become familiar with those kind of coaches because they'll do it once and then they'll keep doing it for an entire season. So if you keep those in your back pocket, it's hard for a sports books algorithm to, to account for that, right? So right. that is a, a pretty good example to use of, of just generally paying attention and keeping those kind of situations in your pocket as potential, you know, plus expected value because, hey, I know that coach A likes to pull his goalie with eight minutes left if he's down three. And look, they're down three right now. I'm going to bet that live over um, because I'm expecting a goalie not to be in the net, his job. He's just going to abandon it, right? That's a right. weird, weird thing about hockey. Um, and generally, I think if, if you are paying attention uh, on a game by game basis, you'll start to pick up, you know, teams that are, um, you know, first period over unders, I think are, are interesting as well. Like in terms of like live betting, like teams do have profiles, um, and on a given season. So if you know, you know, team A is a team that comes out of the gates flying and they, they don't put up, you know, they put up a, a, a goose egg or, or excuse me, they, they put up a, you know, two goals in the first period, that number is going to inflate up, but you know, this team likes to get out to a lead and then they like to nurse that lead across uh, the finish line. You can generally beat the market in those kind of situations. Example. And another example that I think a lot of people, it's not like it's a, a known secret. I don't want to say that because it's not something that just like is like the secret to betting on on a sport. Like if you hear that, it's if something sounds too good to be true, it is right. Um, but a lot of times, because hockey is such a high variant sports that that is played on ice, like that cannot be overstated. Like this sport is played on ice, uh, so there's going to be some crazy stuff that happens uh, in the 60 minutes that these people are skating around on ice. Uh, that you know, a first five minutes, if if it or first 10 minutes, a team's getting badly outplayed they could score a lucky goal, right? Like, and you know, like they're not, they do not deserve this lead, right. but the market is going to adjust and make them the favorite because scoring first in hockey is important. But if you've picked up, you know, they're, they've scored one goal on point one expected goals and the other team is, is throwing a ton of rubber at the net, but the goalie's just standing on his head, there's probably going to be value going the other way on the team uh, to come back. Right. And if you're watching the game, you can see if a goal was a soft goal. Right. You can see if a team is really flying around and understand more than maybe what the algorithm is just telling you. Is there anything also, Mike, like kind of in the evolution of the game, you know, that you can kind of get ahead of? Like we've said, you know, coaches may pull goalies earlier. There's there's less fighting in the game right now, right? More speed in the game. Has that led to maybe any other ways to bet the NHL really because of the evolution? 
evolution either of the athletes or the rules or the style of the NHL over the last decade or so? Yeah, the game has certainly opened up uh, this past 2021, 2022 season. Saw the over cash in over 50% of the time. Uh, and that is the first time in our database at actionnetwork.com, Action Labs, uh, that we've seen that happen since 2005, 2006, which is our the first year of us collecting data on this stuff. So scoring is up and bookmakers know that. You're not going to see fives and fives and a half uh, uh, totals most nights. You're going to see six and a half and sevens. You, we're going to see seven and a half a lot of the time next year as well. So knowing this kind of information, you need to then decide, okay, has the market caught up to the to the uptick in scoring or is it is there still room to grow? And we, we should know that pretty pretty quickly in, in the upcoming season. And then you can use that information to either bet against the trend or, okay, they're not adjusting enough. The, the scoring trend is not stopping. So that's one one thing, uh, one way that the game's kind of evolved. Uh, and the other thing is last year, uh, 2021, 2022, we saw favorites clip at 64.8%, really? which is the highest that we have, once again, in that same Action Labs database. So a sport that generally speaking, you need to be comfortable betting underdogs kind of was flipped on its head. So once again, bookmakers know that. Betting, like all things, is very cyclical. So is next season, the 2022-2023 season, going to be, uh, you know, the, are the dogs going to come back? Are our bookmakers going to adjust? And all of a sudden, people are going to think favorite, favorite, favorite every night. Or is that trend just going to continue? So there's still, that, you know, part of what we talked about from the jump is, you know, the education and learning from your mistakes. And it just shows you that you just can't stop learning and betting. So are we, what are we going to learn next year? Is it, is it, is betting truly the cyclical thing, no matter the sport, or are we just going to see the, is the NHL changing for, for good where these favorites are just going to keep winning and winning and ruining my life. <laughs> so, so, so Mike, one thing I would say is even folks that don't love hockey or the NHL, I've heard them say to me, but the NHL playoffs are amazing to watch. You know, there's so much excitement, so much intensity, right? So bring that to the betting world. Like what is the ultimate high? What is the ultimate intensity in the context of an NHL bet? For me, it's just the same thing that I mentioned before. I take a third period over and then all of a sudden with only like 45 seconds left, the team score. And I get that empty net goal at the very end, cashing on a live over at like plus 340. For you, what would be kind of the ultimate thrill in betting the NHL? Man, uh, there's nothing quite like having, you know, a plus 250 underdog, you know, yeah. blow a three goal lead in the third period <laughs> right. and then win an overtime. That is my favorite thing. Like you, you, cause you get to experience the actual, you know, self-loathing of losing a bet like that, a, a good bet because you think, oh, there's no way that this team, you know, they just blew the three goal lead. There's no way they're going to come back. And then when they actually do, you get to experience both the lows and the highs of, of betting, which, which is why we all do it in, in one uh, fell swoop. So, so I do enjoy that. And, and like you said, there are people, it, it's a huge trope in hockey that, oh, the, the playoffs, NHL playoffs are the best. Like <laughs> if you are betting every night, like you're going to enjoy the sweat of, of hockey, like, like it's a playoff game every night. So that's why I encourage people to kind of get to know it more uh, through betting, which is, is, is definitely the best way to sink your teeth into a new sport. If it's something that you, you're interested in. All right. So one thing I encourage people to do is follow you and your bets on the action network. How can we tell you as our fishermen here in the expert series, how can we find out who you're betting on next NHL season? Yeah, just look for the worst team on the slate and then just click that one. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, my uh, my Action Network handle is uh, Leboff, M-L-E-B-O-F-F-M. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter, uh, the Big Lebowski with, with two E's, and where I generally am spending the NHL season complaining about, um, you know, these underdogs losing in, in very painful fashion. Uh, so um, I'm always happy to talk talk shop when it comes to NHL betting. So, you know, feel free to reach out. Well, all right, all right, all right. This has been the first installment of our Experts Guide to Betting. Like I always say here, we're not just giving you a fish, we are teaching you how to fish. And we thank Michael Lepoff so much for spending a couple of minutes with us and hopefully making you a little bit sharper on the ice. Thanks for stopping by, Mike. 